Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Sipker. Welcome to Eastern Iowa. And the Iowa River Valley near Coralville on our latest edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on this episode of Iowa Outdoors, we climb the Iowa skies to film the state from a vantage point few Iowans can reach. We'll take a trip to prehistoric times with an Eastern Iowa treasure that dates back 375 million years. Discover how the state fairgrounds were the focal point of the planet for up and coming rodeo stars. And we search the Iowa River for rare and endangered species of mussels. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. Iowans with a keen eye for angling take pride in knowing each one of the different types of fish species that inhabit our waters every year. But how many Iowans know each and every one of the 54 different types of mussels in our state? Well, at least Iowa used to have 54 different mussel species before losing nearly a dozen over the past couple decades. Iowa species loss is echoed throughout North America. And it's part of the reason why you'll see researchers wading and groping along the Iowa River for everything from fat muckets to elk toes. So we need to dive 62, <laughs> dive 59, and then just start at 57. Every August since 2005, a group of people gathers over the course of a couple weeks to survey Iowa's mussel populations in eastern Iowa rivers. It's called the annual Mussel Blitz. They're doing important research about a struggling population of simple-looking, yet complex creatures in Iowa waterways where they once thrived, but now can be hard to find. It's been a fun effort, um, trying to teach people, trying to have, have the world's experts here and then having people that just doesn't, don't know much about it at all but want to learn. It's, it's one of the opportunities where somebody can just walk off the street and, and get in when they sign a waiver and they can come in our boat and they can be sitting right next to the world's expert on, on this type of restoration. And it's just been a neat effort. Over the years, the Blitz has targeted several rivers, including the Cedar, Maquoketa, Wapsipinikin, and different pools along the Mississippi. This particular Blitz is covering several miles of the Iowa River near Iowa City. And this site on the Iowa River is one of 10 areas where we've tried to reestablish the species through propagation and reintroduction and relocation of existing populations to areas uh, within the species historic range. And the main reason was to um, remove the species from the threat of zebra mussels. If you're familiar with the zebra mussel, the exotic mussel, I got introduced into the Mississippi and really threatened um, our mussel populations on the Mississippi. So we felt we really needed now is the time to really start reintroducing mussels back into where they historically were. Um, so we didn't have all our eggs in one basket, that we didn't have all our mussels uh, remaining in the, in the Mississippi, so. Researchers and volunteers search for mussels by using a technique called polywogging. Essentially, we're just kind of on our hands and knees deep in the water and then just um, rubbing our hands back and forth. Um, we've got knee pads on in case it's kind of rocky and then gloves and we're just picking up the any um, mussels and the kind of a lot of them false alarm rocks, you know, but um, and then the people have got bags and we'll collect them as we go along and then throw them back at their life. <laughs> With the help of scuba gear, they also use a quad rat to do density studies. 
documenting what they find in a quarter meter square area. Over the course of this blitz, they'll take as many as 600 quadrat samples. But here it is, uh, Fawn's foot. They don't get much bigger than this. So one of the reasons we use this bag is so we can collect little guys like this, otherwise we would never be able to see it or feel it. So we need to do a whole substrate sample. Hey, we did get a live Fawn's foot in that first one. Oh yeah? So this is the first live muscle we found in a quadrat today. Quadrat sample. That's a Fawn's foot, Transilla denosiformis. Now this is, this is one of the more rare mussel species in the upper Midwest, Mississippi, Iowa River. So, this is pretty good news. So we'll go, I'll, um, we'll measure it, we'll age it. This individual looks like it's two years old. You can age them just like you would uh, a tree by counting the annuli lines that they lay down annu annually. So the number of annuli they have is close to its age. At one time, Iowa had 54 species of freshwater mussels. Only about 40 species exist today, and about a third of those are endangered or threatened. This is the kind we're looking for. This is a Higgins eye. This is the ones that we've actually stocked. One of the main goals is to help reestablish the Higgins eye pearly mussel, the areas where it historically lived, such as the Iowa River. On this mussel blitz, crews found seven Higgins eye pearly mussels. Um, mussels are awesome indicators of water quality. You know, they have to sample our water 24-7. These things have to live out there the whole time. The health of the rivers that we swim in, drink in, boat in, we can use mussels. If we can get good water quality, you know, we can, if we have mussels, those will be good places to, to, to be. White heel splitter, 147. We were just walking the quadrat back to the shore and I stepped on this one actually. So it's, it's all sand and mud like this, so I just, I just felt it with my foot and just reached down and grabbed it and it was all depends you find this guy. Mussels and fish are linked. Mussels use fish as carriers to reproduce. Iowa DNR and fish and wildlife officials have put tiny young mussels, about the size of a grain of salt, onto fish gills at the hatchery. Then, when they stock those fish in the rivers, hopefully some of those mussels will find a permanent home. Mussels aren't just hitchhikers. They benefit fish, too. I mean, there's some fish, like drum, catfish, eat mussels, but also the mussels are feeding the fish. Would we have fish out here without mussels? Yes, we would, but we wouldn't have as many, you know? We wouldn't have maybe some of the kinds that our anglers enjoy catching and we have found individuals that we have placed into the river. We found them living 12, 13, 14 years after. So we know once we put them there, those individuals can live. But now we've also found evidence of recruitment of individuals back into those populations. So the individuals we put out are reproducing. So new individuals are coming into that area. And that's really the ultimate goal of this is to establish self-sustaining populations on their own where they won't need our assistance anymore. These obviously are dead. They, sure. The animal inside died, but we find a record of what is here by, by collecting empty shells either along the bank or in the water. The Muscle Blitz brings together a number of government agencies and biologists from states along the upper Mississippi. They also recruit the help of volunteers. You can find out more information about the annual August Muscle Blitz through the Iowa DNR. Here, you can actually do that. You can come and be a part of it. And frankly, volunteers make an effort. Uh, last year, our first Higgins Eye that we found was found by a pure volunteer. That person just showed up off the street. So it was, it was awesome. Muscle research and restoration is an important part of protecting Iowa's waterways, helping to create a healthy ecosystem and an Iowa outdoors that is plentiful with species of native freshwater mussels. If we're willing to give up things like mussels, which a lot of people seem to be willing to do that, and we, you know, we start cutting out parts of our ecosystem, pretty soon the ecosystem is just a simple, um, non-interesting place. It's a lot easier keeping the species that we have here now than to have to do this whole reintroduction later.
In the devastating floods of 1993, floodwaters topped the emergency spillway here at the Coralville Dam, sending a torrent of water down the adjacent hillside. Floodwaters eroded vast amounts of the landscape, obliterating a road and campground. But out of the devastation, an amazing treasure was discovered, an ancient fossilized seafloor ecosystem frozen in time. Predating the age of the dinosaurs, the Devonian fossil gorge is over 375 million years old and is a fascinating glimpse into a piece of Earth's history. The Devonian Fossil Gorge is the Grand Canyon of Iowa. And the critters that lived are seen through the fossils. The whole story is here, written in the rocks. Volunteer Pat Wittenock is a lifelong learner, educator, and lover of geology. For decades, she's been sharing her passion for rocks as an eighth grade science teacher and volunteer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. When the gorge was first revealed, Pat was a student at the University of Iowa and among the first to explore the unearthed fossils. When the spillway was topped over, we as geologists knew there was rock under the ground. But the window of the museum that is here was open to all people. And that museum is the Devonian rocks that you see in front of you. Eastern Iowa's outdoor adventurers quickly flocked to the Fossil Gorge, but its biggest fans are definitely kids. Here, visitors can experience the Devonian age. Predating the dinosaurs, ancient marine life dominated this period, and their footprint is perfectly preserved in the rock, showcasing much of Iowa's native sea life. You can see stems from the crinoids. The little Cheerios are individual segments. You can see whole brachiopods. So this is limestone when I hold it in the sun, and it glitters. The glittering is calcite, calcium carbonate. For those who aren't geologists, the gorge entry is lined with illustrated maps and numbered markers, explaining the many different aspects of the gorge floor. Undeniably, this piece of geological history is for all to share. This is a museum, okay? And this is a museum into the past. But yet on top of it, you see things growing, right? So you're in the past by looking at these things, and you can go back in time like a time machine, but then you're here also today, and it, it's like a key to the past. The word drone has become synonymous with the American military. Its use in a news headline almost always draws comparisons to foreign intelligence gathering and even advanced missile attacks. But drones are being used in much simpler, yet still impressive tasks. Here in Iowa, Drone photography and videography are on the cutting edge of images one can produce in your own backyard. While the legality of drone use is still being ironed out, some Midwesterners are busy capturing images that only a few years ago would have required a helicopter. All across the nation, unmanned aerial system, or drone enthusiasts, are using remote-controlled helicopters to capture our world as we've rarely seen it before, from above. Before the emergence of small drones, aerial views such as these were only available via large helicopters, manned by commercially licensed pilots. Today, literally anyone can purchase a miniature drone and start filming the world around them. Joe Stone and Brad Perdue, two friends from Ogden with a passion for RC helicopters, quickly decided to purchase a drone after seeing a flyby video of the Space Needle in Seattle. I just loved how the drone went around everybody. Everybody was waving to it. I mean, it was that night when I saw him, I just ordered it off Amazon, told Brad what I was thinking about doing, and we both decided this, this would be fun, and after that, we were kind of hooked. 
kind of had an idea of showing people the Midwest, maybe parts that they didn't know existed. We thought, well, we know some spots in Iowa and Minnesota that we could expose to the world through YouTube. Dozens of Iowans have similar stories, with pilots capturing attractions from border to border, including the State Capitol Building, the Mississippi River, the Campanile at Iowa State University, and many more. As for Joe and Brad, their first location was one of central Iowa's more scenic bike trails. The first spot we picked, Trestle Bridge. We did it, put the video online, thinking maybe a few hundred people would watch it, and we got 50,000 views, and we were just blown away by that. Since the High Trestle Trail, Joe and Brad have traveled across the state, filming all kinds of attractions, including Boone's Kate Shelley Bridge, the Grotto of Redemption in West Bend, and even video of farmers working in their fields. While drone pilots can fly solo, Joe and Brad's two-man system is ultimately what keeps them from damaging their equipment and flying where they're not supposed to. We always fly with a spotter, so when he's watching on screen, he's gonna be looking at mainly what shot he's taken, and I'm just kind of the, the guy that shouts and is annoying, you know, where the trees are, what you're doing, you know, and just try to keep him safe, just make sure we, we're following all the rules and everything. And the rules for drone flying are constantly changing. As of summer 2015, the FAA guidelines allow hobbyist pilots to fly over public spaces as long as they maintain line of sight with their drone, keep 400 feet from obstacles, steer clear of manned aircraft, and stay a minimum of five miles from public airports. I mean, when we first got it, we were scared to do anything. Now we'll, we'll get a little bit more and more courage as we go along, flying under bridges. I mean, you have to be really safe when you're flying. Having two sets of eyes on their quadcopter has helped Brad and Joe steer clear of trouble so far. But for less cautious pilots, the general ease of drone piloting can quickly fly them into areas they shouldn't be. Well, it's actually very easy to fly as long as you have a good satellite connection. It'll hold itself steady. Your left stick here uh, is your elevation, and then left to right on the left stick is which way the quadcopter is facing, and then the right stick is all about movement. When you lose your satellites, things can get a little bit tricky. It'll start to drift on its own. And that's where the RC experience helps out a lot. With open sky abundant in Iowa's rural areas, the duo can easily set out to film attractions like Ledges State Park. We just captured some of the, the hot spots of out here. One was a lookout point over, over the river. Uh, the other was called Lost Lake. And then with the creek winding through the canyon, that's kind of everyone's favorite part. It's just a nice area with a lot of good memories as kids. Joe and Brad's Phantom is one of the more popular models on the market, but there are all shapes and sizes of drones, with some pilots even opting to build their own. Across the state in Cedar Falls, that's exactly how full-time photographer Tim Dodd got into aerial photography, building an extremely powerful, albeit unreliable, drone. I mean, I wanted to have the best camera up in the sky you could, but realistically what it came down to is I was making so many compromises in the flying, and the flying of it, and in the flights, that, uh, that it really was so much simpler just to actually have a turnkey solution that was out of the box. You know, you make a compromise with the worst camera, but considering I can change all the settings, I can change the ISO and shutter speed and all these different things while it's flying in the air. So it's almost like having more control over a worse camera than having no control over a better camera. But even though Tim's drone doesn't have a state-of-the-art camera, it still captures some magnificent footage. No matter if you're a professional photographer or remote control enthusiast, Tim says the allure of drones is capturing images that are otherwise impossible to create. You're always looking for that, you know, viewpoint or that vantage point that other people don't have, you know. How many times have you been like, oh, I wish I could just get up there, you know, or here, or here. And that's, I think, the root of, you know, why aerial photography is so appealing is because you can do that. You can get a totally different vantage point and literally fly a camera up in the air 
and get something that you know that a new perspective that that other people aren't able to get sometimes it's amazing and there's so you know there's so many different tiers that you can go from something that's teeny tiny and forty dollars and you can spend hundred and fifty dollars get something a little more significant so I think it's, it's a really easy thing to get into Calf roping and bull riding are generally activities not associated with the state of Iowa. However, all across the country, and yes, right here in Iowa, cowboy culture is alive and thriving. Every year, student athletes compete with the hope of reaching the National Junior High Rodeo Championships. In 2015, Des Moines played host at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. Beyond being crowned a champion, ropers, riders, and racers compete all week long for a chance at hundreds of thousands of dollars in college scholarships. The entire year's work has led up to the next eight seconds. Come on, let's do it. Young cowboys and cowgirls giving it their all, hoping for one good ride at the National High School Rodeo Association Junior High Championship Finals, hosted in 2015 at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. Student athletes, families, and their equine companions from all over the world in hopes of winning a national title. We represent 48 member organizations, which is most of uh, all the United States. We have 42 U.S. states, we have five Canadian provinces in the country of Australia. They compete in most of your traditional rodeo events. So you'll see bull riding, you'll see your, your roping events from your calf roping. Uh, you, we don't do steer wrestling for the little kids, but we do something called shoot dogging. So they actually have a, an animal, a smaller type of steer, that they will they will hold in a chute and we'll let them out and then they will they will throw that steer. Competitors and spectators alike can feel the adrenaline rush that comes with competing in barrel racing, goat tying, bareback and saddle bronc steer riding, and many more events. The intensity is one of the many traits that makes rodeo so exciting. I'm here mainly because I love seeing the future of our sport. You know, this is the grassroots. This is where it all starts. You know, the, the world champions that you see on TV today started somewhere, and this is where a lot of them got their roots, and they cut their teeth here in junior high rodeo as a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader. And to see the best of the best from all over the world come here to Des Moines this week, uh, you get to see what, what the next generation of world champions has got to offer. The thing I like about it is you get to travel and compete. I just liked horses and like farming and cows and stuff, so I figured if I put all that together, rodeo is the best thing, and you know, you compete and win money and have fun doing it, it's a fun event. While champions are awarded with trophies and plaques for their hard work, the accolades belong to the four-legged athletes as well. Animal welfare is our number one concern at all levels, and they get fed before we do, they get pampered, I mean, they work eight seconds a night, sometimes only three nights a week. Um, they get all the feed and hay they want, they roam free when they get back home, and I've always said that if I come back in another life, I want to be a rodeo animal just because of the way we treat them. The animals are our rock stars. I mean, obviously without the four-legged athletes, the two-legged athletes couldn't do their job. On the road to the junior rodeo finals, both athlete and animal put in weeks of training in order to be crowned a champion, a huge commitment that extends beyond student athlete and must be taken seriously. A lot of people say this right here is vacation, but you really think about it, it ain't that much vacation. You come out here and you rope at night and you rope during the day. And it's fun in a way, but it's hard work. It ain't really a vacation in the way I look at it. To be in rodeo, it is. it requires the support of everybody in your family. When we finish this national finals, the next year starts, and most states will have at least 20 rodeos a year, so for 10 or 20 weekends a year, you're up close and personal with your kids, you're working with them, uh, they're practicing during the week, they're taking care of their horses, so a lot of personal responsibility, self-discipline, character development, it, and a tremendous amount of family involvement. It, this is such a great event. It's a family-friendly event. You know, the, the best thing about where we're at in our level of rodeo is that there is a lot of family support and being that the parents are right here along with them, you know, helping them in victory and defeat and they're right there helping them saddle horses and take care of animals and stuff and, and just getting to see the families is a big thing that, that you watch here this week in Des Moines. That wraps up this late summertime edition of Iowa Outdoors.
If you're planning your summer or even fall travel, check out our extensive video archives of adventures across the state online at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. Our fifth season of Iowa Outdoors will continue with monthly installments throughout 2015 with stories from every corner of our state. We'll leave you now with some more images of summertime in Iowa. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users.